With that, let me uh, uh, turn attention now to my purpose today, which is to get us all thinking more specifically than any ever before. And I was going to say about the amazing, but I now will say the exceedingly astonishing <laughs> and illuminating timing of the translation of the Book of Mormon during the months of April, May, and June in 1829. Now this talk is a slightly more focused version of the annual Willis Lecture that I gave at BYU on this subject. You can find that longer version as one of the featured videos along with thousands of other items on the Book of Mormon Central website. Also let me mention that the latest edition, the second edition of this book, Opening the Heavens, is uh, available from BYU Studies. People sometimes ask, well, what's new in the second edition? There's a five-page chart going along with and summarizing over 150 pages of source material and analysis of the miraculous translation of the Book of Mormon. We have lots of evidence to help us put together what happened, and I'm going to show some of that evidence to you today. But the five-page chart at the middle of that is new, and it goes day by day telling you where in the process of translation Joseph and Oliver were starting on April the 7th, the first day that Joseph and Oliver worked together. I think you'll find this chart powerfully interesting and very useful. Now, because today is April the 7th, I'm going to focus my remarks about that landmark day. That was the first day that Oliver Cowdery sat down in the morning, picked up his quill pen, dipped it into his small inkwell, and began to write down, amazingly, line after line, the words that he heard coming from the voice of a 23-year-old prophet, Joseph Smith. Oliver had arrived in the remote village of Harmony, Pennsylvania, on Sunday evening, just two days before April the 5th. He had walked more than 100 miles to get there. Why did Oliver Cowdery come? Well, because as Joseph Smith himself wrote, in 1832, and here you see Joseph's own handwriting, the Lord appeared, he says, unto a young man by the name of Oliver Cowdery and showed unto him the plates in a vision and also the truth of the work and what the Lord was about to do through me, his unworthy servant. Therefore, he was desirous to come and write for me to translate not a lot of people know that Oliver Cowdery had that first vision. Might Joseph's mention of Oliver's vision here in 1832 be confirmed in the Doctrine and Covenants in section 6? This, I think, is a new uh, connection that we can draw. In the Doctrine and Covenants, it just says that section 6 was revealed in April. I would like to be more specific and suggest that it was revealed at the end of the day on April the 7th, after Oliver had written a few words, as is mentioned in section 6, verse 17. Listen to how that revelation commends Oliver. Blessed art thou for what thou hast done, for thou hast inquired of me, and thou hast received instruction of my spirit. If it had not been so, thou wouldst not have come to the place, Harmony, Pennsylvania, where thou art at this time. The revelation then continued. If you desire a further witness, cast your mind upon the night that you cried unto me in your heart that you might know concerning the truth of these things. That is, of Joseph's calling to translate the Book of Mormon. We've heard this phrase before, did I not speak peace to your mind concerning this matter? But had you connected that with Oliver Cowdery's inquiry 
that then led him to come to help Joseph with this process. Well, for these reasons, I think it must have been very pleasing and maybe also astonishing to Oliver that Joseph took Oliver immediately into his full confidence. Why did he do that? Perhaps they had compared closely the details that they had each independently experienced in these visionary and revelatory experiences. Both of them were completely confident that the other was telling the absolute truth. With that assurance, Joseph allowed Oliver to work as his dedicated scribe, seated only, here we go, seated only a couple feet away at the same small table as Joseph Smith translated. And Oliver obeyed the Lord's instruction in section 6, verse 18. Stand by my servant Joseph. Five years later, Oliver wrote to W.W. Phelps, Near the time of the setting of the sun, Sabbath evening, April 5th, 1829, my natural eyes, he said, for the first time beheld this brother. It sounds to me like Oliver is remembering that previously he had seen through his spiritual eyes Joseph Smith and the work that was being done. Continuing, Oliver says, on Monday the 6th, I assisted him in arranging some business of a temporal nature. We've never known what that business might have been. And on Tuesday the 7th, commenced to write the Book of Mormon. These were days never to be forgotten. All of those days in harmony were never to be forgotten, but these first three days, I think, Oliver would have remembered most of all. Like your first day at college or the first time you met your future spouse. That first day, April 7th, must have really blown Oliver away, exceeding all of his expectations as he sat, as he says, under the sound of Joseph's voice as he dictated by the inspiration of heaven the Book of Mormon. But how can we be sure that Oliver remembered the date April 7th correctly? Well, indeed he did. How do we know that? Because not long ago, Gordon Madsen, located in a nearby Pennsylvania courthouse, the legal papers that were lodged there when Joseph Smith sold his property in Harmony two years later in 1831 to Joseph Noble, a local businessman. Those legal documents secured Noble's chain of title and fortunately included the original 1829 agreement between Joseph Smith and Emma's father, Isaac Hale. And that agreement was dated April 6, 1829, absolutely proving that on April 6, 1829, Joseph Smith became the legal owner of the cabin and the property where they had been living in Harmony, Pennsylvania. Interestingly, two signatures witnessed that agreement on April 6th. One of them was Oliver's, and the other, Samuel Smith's. So we know that Oliver was in Harmony on April the 6th, and we also know what the business was that he and Joseph conducted that day. The other witness, Samuel Smith, was Joseph's younger, younger brother. He had been in harmony for a few weeks, having come in March with Joseph Smith Sr. to help Joseph Jr. with work on his farm. On that April 6th agreement, a ledger on the back shows that Joseph paid Isaac $65 that day and promised to pay the balance in the future. Joseph will make that final payment in 1831 as is documented on the back of the April 6th document. That April 6th legal transaction gave Joseph Smith ownership, a legal right to say who could and could not come onto his property, into this small wooden home there. 
And with that right, I believe he finally had a degree of essential security so that neither Isaac Hale nor any others could disturb the translation process. And with that, the very next morning, April 7th, Joseph and Oliver commenced work. Thus what I call anchor date one in trying to figure out the timing of the Book of Mormon is April the 7th. And that date is legally secure. Four other dates are securely determinable during the next three months. Anchor date two is May 15th, the date of John the Baptist's visitation. On that day, Joseph and Oliver had reached in the translation 3rd Nephi 11 and soon chapter 18, where the resurrected Lord gave the 12 New World disciples first the power to baptize, and then at the end of that day before he ascended, the power to bestow the gift of the Holy Ghost. Anchor date three is May 30th. That date is secure as the date when they finished the Book of Moroni and also the title page. David Whitmer had come and they pack up and move to Fayette where they will complete the translation uh, there. Anchor date four is June 11th. This is also absolutely secure. This is the date when they filed the copyright application in the federal court to obtain copyright uh, for the Book of Mormon. We now have the original form that was filed that day. It's been found in the Library of Congress, and here's a copy of that. And you'll notice that where the form calls for a description of the title of the book that's being uh, copyrighted, what did Joseph write there? Here in a slightly larger form, you can see that it was the title page of the Book of Mormon. Notice that, June 11th, he's already using the title page, which must have been translated as the last of the large plates of Nephi in harmony before they moved to Fayette. Anchor date number five then, oh, and by the way, the date of the filing is June 11th on the back of that document. June 11th, uh, June 30th then is uh, the fifth of these anchor dates because we know that by the end of June they have completed the translation process, the small plates having been translated there in Fayette. The three and the eight witnesses received their visitations the last couple days of June. Well, what this tells us is but between April 7th and June 30th, there were 85 total calendar days. We would like to know how many words Joseph and Oliver translated per day, let's say on April the 7th. Now, in order to know that, we can begin by calculating their average length of time uh, that they, uh, the average rate of translation that they must have accomplished in order to have translated the book within the available time. And simply stated, it's got to be less than 85 days. But of those 85 days, we're going to have to discount 11 of them because of travels to Colesville, moving to Fayette, and other things including baptisms, taking care of the copyright, the three and the eight witnesses, reducing this to only 74 possible days for actual translation. But wait a minute, we have to reduce it even further because there were many days that were partially unavailable. Sometimes they would pack and unpack or do business or write letters, farming and chores. There was certainly personal time with Emma who was very much involved, I think, in the process, not only helping with Oliver and Joseph and their need for lunch and dinner, but you remember, this is a very small, small home. Uh, it's got a bedroom and uh, the main room on the ground floor and a summer kitchen. But Emma's at home most of the time. I imagine that Emma overheard a lot of what was going on. She, in a way, is 
also experiencing the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and must have been as astounded as Oliver was as this process proceeded. There were visitors who came, Samuel for quite a while, other visits from Hiram, David, there are baptisms that were performed. There are 16 Sundays, and I wondered, do they work on Sunday or did they take time for some uh, religious uh, worship? and a pause, a break, at least a little bit from their daily chores? Well, if you take those 17 days with partially uh, being used, I think the realistically possible number of days for actual work is reduced further to 60. And if you wonder what else they're doing at that time, just look at the Doctrine and Covenants and you'll see that sections 6 through 18 Another 1,124 words in section 6, on down through section 18, a total of 6,124 words were revealed, written, delivered to the people to whom those revelations were given, also during this time period. What that says is there's a lot going on during these translation days, and no wonder Oliver says, those were days never to be forgotten. So we wanted to do some calculation, coming back to the question of how many words per day on average did they produce? Well, if you use Royal Skousen's formulation, and it's uh, very close in any edition, I've counted 269,510 words, total words in the uh, Book of Mormon. Now, that's 4,500 words finished final copy per day if you're looking at a possible 60 days of actual work. At a rate of 15 words per minute, in order to translate and produce 4,500 words, you're going to have to be working about five and a half hours solid. But of course you're going to have to come up for air. You've got to take a break. Your hand is going to get tired. You're not just going to be able to do this in one five and a half hour time frame. So we don't know exactly how long it took them to do those 4,500 words on average. Uh, but uh, maybe they uh, went slower on some days and faster on others. But the parameters here do not allow great variation beyond uh, this rate, which is about 15 words per minute. To test the feasibility of the uh, 15 words per minute, my wife, Jeannie, and I actually tried this out. Sitting close to each other, I played the role of Joseph Smith and read the first lines slowly and distinctly, while she, playing the role of Alvin Cowdery, <coughs> began immediately writing those words down. When she reached the end of that line, she read it back to me and I confirmed that it was correct or pointed out mistakes. I then paused, as I thought Joseph must have done, caught my breath, gazed again at the page, uncovered the next line and read it aloud, which Joseph, which Jeannie likewise recorded and read back. And so we proceeded. All the while, we had a stopwatch running. We imagined that Emma was keeping time. And at the end, we counted out the number of words on the pages we had covered and divided that by the number of minutes to get our rate of words per, per minute. We found that we could do about 20 words per minute, and a similar experience by my state scripture study class confirmed that about 20 words per minute at a short stint was possible. But none of us could imagine sustaining that rate for more than five hours a day. Our hands got tired. All of us as readers needed time to clear our voices. We had ballpoint pens and not a quill pen and ink well. Although not strictly scientific, this exercise produced for us all a flood of experiential insight. I think these would have been things that Oliver especially on that first day would have been introduced to. The
success of trying to achieve a maximum accuracy took a substantial toll on us. People claim Joseph struggled to keep their minds focused on the line at hand as they waited for Oliver to finish and read it back, losing your train of thought. Thoughts wandered, anticipating what might come next. We noticed more details in the text and were actually distracted as we thought, I've never heard that before. Joseph and Oliver must have had that thought every single line. They had never heard the word before. <laughs> we wondered, how long did Joseph pause after Oliver had read back the line to him? Did the process work seamlessly, like a teleprompter, or more slowly? Those playing the role of Oliver had to be patient, diligently pay attention, very close attention, as actually Oliver had been counseled to do in Doctrine of Covenant 6. They wanted to pause and enjoy the impressive gems that regularly emerged but the inexorable, pro well, the inexorable process did not allow time for that. Others commented that the doctrine and prose was amazingly coherent. One of our participants said, even Mormon's long, record-setting, complex sentences made sense in the end. Think about that. If you're only getting these sentences phrase at a time, and you've already covered about ten sentences, you've got to say to yourself, now where am I? Where's the subject in this sentence? And how's it going to agree with the verb that I've still got to see here? It was none of that. One said, I had empathy for Joseph and Oliver who did this for hours each day. It was a spiritual experience to get these words a bit at a time coming spontaneously for it. Now, I encourage any of you to try this experiment. Take turns, each of you, serving each of these roles. Well, now let's uh, apply this um, to April 7th. And uh, I'm going to go real quickly here, and, uh, but I just wanted to say, if you go to my chart, what Oliver and Joseph probably began with was Mosiah chapter 2. We know that there was a few things written that Emma had worked on that scribe, but not much. And uh, so I started with Mosiah chapter 2 thinking, well, oh, wouldn't that be a place to have started? This is King Benjamin's speech. Can you imagine doing Mosiah chapters 2, 3, and 4? That's 4,205 words. So a little slower than the average rate that they will eventually get up to, but I imagine that on day one, they were probably still getting to know each other and figuring out how this was going to work. So it would make sense that we should not expect them to have gotten quite as far as normal. But still, that's a pretty productive day's work. Mosiah chapters 2, 3, and 4. I mean, imagine what Oliver would have thought as he heard, and what Joseph would have thought as they hear for the first time King Benjamin's speech. As they hear, when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, pause. Oliver writes down And what's next? They don't know, you do, but they didn't know. You are only in the service of your God. Amazing. But we've got to move on. You cannot say that ye are even as much as the dust of the earth. Yet ye were created of the dust of the earth. But behold, it what? belongeth to him who created you. And I, whom you call your king, am also of the dust. And he shall call himself Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the Creator of all things from the beginning. 
a multiple complex divine name. His blood atoneth for the sins of those who have fallen by the transgression of Adam. You have died not knowing the will of God concerning them. I wonder if Emma heard that and thought, my son who died, they lost a son not long before this. The atonement covers even that infant child. Or who are ignorantly sinned. But woe unto him who knoweth that he rebelleth against God. Well, all of that and much more was before they had even stopped for lunch. And I doubt that they uh, noticed the exquisite chiastic structure of Isaiah chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 along the way. <laughs> and after lunch, they do Mosiah chapter 4. And it just gets better and better. Believe that you must repent of your sins and forsake them. Humble yourself before God. He will teach your children to walk in, oh yes, the ways of truth and soberness. Teach them to love one another and to serve one another. And also, ye yourselves will succor those that stand in need of your succor. Can you imagine hearing those words for the first time? And all these things are to be done in wisdom and order. What a beginning for Oliver. What a beginning for the world. What a beginning for all of us. Well, brothers and sisters, of all the things that this study has done for me, it has given me greater gratitude for the Lord. I believe that knowing of its coming forth, including its timing, should inform and even transform our experience every time we read or handle the Book of Mormon. As the Collister has called it, God's priceless gift to us. And every time Joseph Smith was asked, how did you do it? And you know, I don't think he could explain any more than you could explain how your iPhone works. How the interpreters worked in displaying the, cave, the text that he would then read as he uh, went from one verse to another. But what did he say? How was it done? with power from on high, by the gift of power of God, by the power of God, direct from God, dictated by God from him. Well, brothers and sisters, I pray that what we know now about the coming forth of the translation of the book of God will help us all to react with increased faith, the reliability of this process, it was a tightly controlled, regulated, very, uh, very precise process. It didn't allow for ad-libbing or variation. There was no time to stop and do research. No time to even look up the scripture anywhere even if they wanted to. No time for outlining, drafting. No line for saying, uh, Who's we got to be sure that we uh, get King Benjamin's voice consistent throughout this. But you know, King Benjamin is the only one in the Book of Mormon to ever use the word omnipotent. And he uses it five times. The Lord God omnipotent. Of course, Benjamin was a king. He's interested in power. So he's interested in God being an all-powerful being. Isn't it interesting? that Benjamin's fingerprint of his style will never show up again in the Book of Mormon except where he's quoted later on in Hilo in chapter 5. And the word omnipotent will never again be used in the Book of Mormon. Joseph and Oliver translated that and moved on, maybe even not remembering exactly what they had translated as the mind that had not yet wrapped around the importance of these things that will come soon, but not in the immediate translation process. Brothers and sisters, I pray that 
All of this will fill you with increased love from the moment. I know that it is increased greatly by Heavenly Father. To know that He cares about time. He wants to bless us for time and for all eternity. He knows about dispensations of time. He prepares the way so that things can happen on a timetable. He knows, even though He is an eternal being, what it is like for us to be in time. He gives us signs of the time. He gives us time, time to repent, which is the essence of His mercy. I hope that all of these feelings, as we think about time, to soften our hearts and make people everywhere more receptive to the Holy Ghost, to realize that God's hand has again set to work among us, giving us the Book of Mormon, as the Book of Mormon itself says, as a sign that the Second Coming and the Restoration has now commenced. I hope that the Holy Ghost will bear testimony to all of the magnificent, multifaceted, and manifest truthfulness of the Book of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. I so pray in the name of the one of whom this Book of Mormon testifies, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.